important. Like if you really, if you want to make it to the final stage, you're going to need a coach. Of making mm -hmm. the speech craft be what he wanted it to be. Welcome to the District 7 podcast presented by Podmasters, where we interview Toastmasters with interesting stories and experiences. This interview with Jeff and Elizabeth Spitzer, where Jeff explores his experience winning the District 7 International Speech Contest, starting with the stories at the start that inspired the speech through each revisions at each stage to winning the District 7 International Speech Contest. And now introducing Jeff and Elizabeth Spitzer. All right, so we're, we're here today with Jeff and Liz Spitzer. And this is a continuing series of podcasts that Ray Miller and I, Bob Hall, have been doing over the past few months. And we're going to be interviewing what is becoming known throughout the district as a power couple. And we're, 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 we're going to dive into some of that stuff. They're shaking their heads, but we're going to talk about this a little bit. We're going to get them separately. And then we're going to bring them together at the end. And we're going to talk a little bit about this this um, piece of nomenclature that's been attached to them and either confirm it or dispel it. You, the listener, will be the judge. We're going to talk to Jeff first about some things that we learned about him that we're dying to know more about. He is the District 7 International Speech Contest winner. Not, not this year, but in the past, he has won the District 7 International Speech Contest. He's a state coordinator for an organization known as Braver Angels. And he's a mentor, a coach, and I think he and Liz are both pickleball aficionados. We may not get into that, but we uh, will certainly throw it out there for consideration if they wanted to chip in and kind of talk about that tangentially. So my first question for Jeff and, and, and Ray, you know, you, you feel free to ask this, the next question, the follow-up question. The first question I have for Jeff, it's softball question. Are you ready, Jeff? First question is- I like softballs. How did you feel when they announced your name as the District 7 Speech Contest winner? That is a softball. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, Bob and Ray. Good to see you again tonight. How did it feel? It felt pretty darn fantastic, I got to admit. I was a little nervous. Well, I was a lot nervous at different stages of the contest based on the competition in the contest. And when they announced the third place and then the second place, I was pretty sure I had to be first place, but I was really surprised and happy to be in the top three. So, and let, let alone win it. Tell us a little bit about what the speech was about. It was about my experiences. One is part of the organization that you mentioned, Braver Angels, which is working to depolarize America. And they do that by bringing the two sides. There, there are people on all sides. I consider myself pretty purple, pretty much in the middle. But there is a big rift between liberals and conservatives in this country, in case you hadn't noticed. And what Braver Angels does is bring them together to better understand each other. So the speech talked about, I opened it with a rift in my own family and talked about rift in broader society. And I talked about what Braver Angels does. And I left the audience with a couple of suggestions that they could try on their own. So, so tell me about a little bit more about Brave. What attracted you to Braver Angels? The internal motivation, you know, your, your purple. I mean, where does that come from? And try to relate it to Toastmasters if you can. So my interest in something like that predates Toastmasters for about as long as I can remember, really as long as social media has existed anyway, I would see my friends on social media, Facebook in particular, around election time, get a little nutty and get very finger pointy but it was only around elections and then as soon as the election was over there'd be a couple more days of complaining and then it would go back to normal but after around 2016 it it was all the time right it wasn't just around an election it was all year long and it would drive me bananas and 
I would you would see it in the news, you would see it on social media, you could even see it in your community, depending on how plugged in you are. And I had told Liz at the time, probably 2018 or so, I was like, we gotta do something about this because we're both coaches. Like, we gotta do something. And she was like, I want no part of that. <laughs> She's like, you can figure that out. I want no part of it. It wasn't until the tumultuous summer of 2020, <laughs> anyone remembers between COVID ravaging the country or the world, between the killing of George Floyd and all the protests and the unrest around that, and things just ratcheted up even more. Things got uglier online. Things got uglier in our communities. And that pushed me off the sidelines. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to do something. I wanted to contribute in a way where I could leverage the skills that I have and bring those to the table and as a coach, as a Toastmaster, as somebody who can help bring people together. So what I had long seen as the core of many of our issues is that we don't talk to each other anymore. We don't get to know each other. We don't understand each other. We just hide behind screens and point fingers. Everything is somebody else's fault. And until we bring people together to better understand each other, we're not gonna solve anything. So I went specifically looking for organizations that focused on bridging divides by bringing people together to have dialogue. I found several organizations that do so. If anybody's curious about the other organizations I, I found, I'm, I'm happy to, to send a list. The Braver Angels really spoke to me. They, they were speaking directly about the main issue that I wanted to address, which was the political divide. And so I jumped right in. It was summer of 2020. It was perfect timing because they really needed someone who could help bring things online since they couldn't meet in person anymore. And I've been involved ever since. So this mm. the speech obviously resonated with all the judges at the, the speech contest. Uh, and you you explained it in a way that would resonate with people. I mean, you, you could easily get uh, in, into this headbutting mindset. Somebody says, oh, I'm blue, I'm staunch blue, I'm staunch red. You are able to bridge that divide with your speech. That takes some skill to do that. That's not easy to do. And you did it in a way that won a speech contest. I mean, that's extremely extremely impressive i can't tell you how much i'm impressed with that um toastmasters has a module um conflict management mm -hmm. and and so we do teach these principles in toastmasters how to how to manage conflict what are your thoughts about um taking this message this conflict management because we have conflict within toastmasters within toastmasters clubs within between between uh, club officers between district officers Hmm. Anywhere you have people, you're going to find conflict. You do. That's right. That's right. It's not just a political conflict. There are conflict, interpersonal conflicts. You got a message for District Seven Toastmasters on how to how to do a better job of conflict management. Do I have a message yes. for them? <laughs> yes. Boy, I'm. <laughs> I'm no conflict resolution specialist. I just want to bring people together to talk. But I would say that's the biggest thing is what I see in a lot of conflicts, especially politically and in other organizations at work, is we tend to make assumptions about the other person's intentions. Okay. So we jump to conclusions in our own mind without actually talking to somebody to find out what's bringing them to their decision or whatever it is that they're bringing to the table that's in conflict. And if we could just get more curious rather than say, no, I don't wanna do it that way. I wanna do it this way or that way is wrong. This way is better. Ask more questions, get more curious, find out what it is they're trying to address, what it is that, what their experiences are that brought them to that suggestion or that opinion. And once you get behind it, like understand what's behind it, then you can actually start to make progress because you understand where they're coming from and you might be able to help them see why they're wrong. That's a joke. <laughs> Let's, no, but you might be able to, I, that was totally a joke. Never would say that, but you might be able to 
like once you understand where they're coming from, you can help position your solution in a way that addresses their concerns and that for start to move forward. That, that is that is great advice. Um, we got to get this message out to to Toastmasters in general because oftentimes clubs fold over the, the silliest of little things because people are talking past each other. They're not listening to each other. Ray, I, 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 see, I see you questions. scratching your chin there. You got I've been scratching questions. my chin and I have all kinds of questions because I wanted to talk about a bunch of other things too. My my curiosity, Jeff, I mean, I I really I like the Braver, Braver Angels, uh, the, the mission behind it. But what I'm actually really curious of is the metamorphosis, the construction of your speech, like where, what level, um, like at one, what point in the, in the, uh, contest cycle, did you start preparing or putting together this speech? Like what was your first initial draft, your first idea there? I think I went through seven iterations of that speech by the time mm -hmm. I got to district and the original version that I gave the first time I gave it, I gave it in my home club, not in the contest, but just for practice. And it got a lot of feedback that I was surprised by because my original opening for my speech was not about family conflict. That was in the speech, but it was later on in the speech. Mm. My original opening of the speech was a dialogue. I had a red hat and a blue hat and I was playing dialogue. I would, I would put one the blue hat on and insult the red person, and I would put the, the red hat on and insult the blue person. And I thought that was really clever, and I thought it was really fun, and Liz is shaking her head because it made her cringe, and apparently it made a lot of other folks in the club cringe, and they said, you're going to offend people with that. You can't open your speech that way. And so that was very good advice. My uh, my 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 curiosity around it is because I know like I've been in in uh, well I got up to division contest level before, uh, and I know what that process is like and how much a speech will change over the course of uh, of uh, while you're doing it. So I'm I, I'm curious from the first time you did it when you got all the, the the red hat and the blue hat and the feedback for the you know head shaky you know, bad feedback for it, or perhaps actually good feedback for it. How, how different was it by the time you had given it for the second time or the third? It wasn't from, from one version, from version one to version seven, the changes weren't that drastic in like version to version. But by the time you got from one to seven, they changed quite a bit, if that makes sense. So I would, yeah. I would iterate, I would add something in, take something out, reword something, you know, I would get feedback that something worked well and something else didn't. So I was just constantly changing and I was constantly trying to find a better way of phrasing something, a more succinct way of, of getting my message across because you only have seven minutes, right? And yeah. I think the original version of the speech was closer to 10 minutes. And then I had to really trim it down. So my my writing style is, for any speech is just the free write. I just free write, free write, free write. Yeah. And then I pare it down and I start to like reorder things and, and add structure to it. And so that original version, I think, clocked in close to 10 minutes. And then so it was a lot of cutting it down, rewording, shuffling things. And I didn't just get feedback from my club. I went and I visited other other clubs. I visited... That was going to be my next question is, is yeah. as you were iterating, as you were working on this speech, um, how did you go about bringing in coaches, bringing in very specific feedback? Did you just accept the feedback from everybody that was around you? Or did you seek out people like, well, I'm going to point at Liz, who's on my screen right now, um, to immediately to my right. Um, and of course, you got feedback from her. Did you, is there anybody else in the district that you tapped on the shoulder and said, okay, I'm really working on this little piece or this little piece or any part of it to get structure out of it? Not a specific person. There, there were a couple of people in my club 
who gave me more feedback on the side, like via email and what they appreciated. So I asked, you know, I told them, if you have more feedback, let me know, I wanna hear it. And they did, but I didn't seek out, other than Liz, I really didn't seek out anyone specific as like a coach. I think I will in the future. That, that's something important. Like if you really, if you want to make it to the final stage, you're going to need a coach is one of the things that I've learned. You, you need somebody. But what I had done, so 2022, that was the first time that I'd entered the speech competition and I ended up winning it. <laughs> and I, I was honestly, I was only able to go as far as I did and win the district because of all the clubs that allowed me to visit virtually and give me feedback. And the thing about feedback I learned early on is like I would have one part of my speech where somebody would love it, somebody else would hate it, you know? Yeah. And, oh, and that's the nature of to, any feedback, any evaluation. You're discern, always, yeah. Yeah. What, really what feedback works for, for you. Myself. Exactly. Yeah. What, what I wanted to, what I wanted to accept and what I didn't and really just trust my instincts. That is the secret to good coaching and good coachy what's the word being a being somebody to be coached to be coached is to seek out a good coach and to recognize the coaches that are helping you with it a question for liz there do you remember this period this this process of building the speech idea do you remember any of your thoughts as you as you were kind of reflecting back on it I'm a person who tends to naturally avoid conflict or uncomfortable feelings and emotions in others. And when they do show up, I tend to try to think of like, what's the way that we can bring everybody back to some state of homeostasis, right? And so like, for example, that red hat, blue hat, I was like, oh, that's going to bring up a lot of emotion and you don't want to enter that right out of the gate you know that might be something you leave people with in the middle lead people to in the middle but then you got to give them a solution so they can resolve their emotion that kind you know so we talked about that a bit um and he would oh he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and and i'd hear this like shoot darn it ah from the office because he was trying to always manage it down and down and down and down in his time. And he was very frustrated when he would deliver it as fast as he thought he could. And then he was over time. And so then he was like back to the board. How do what I, what do I cut? And in those moments, he would sometimes bring me his draft and say, how could I make this shorter? So I would look at it and I'd say, well, I don't think you need to say this this way, or you could probably take this out and get the same point across. And Ray, one of the things that I'd like to share with everyone is that though I, I do have some speech writing, not skills really, but ability, one of the things I really respected about Jeff is that he would listen to what I would say. And then sometimes he'd just shake his head and go, no, I really don't care what you just said. I'm gonna still do it my way. <laughs> I didn't say it like that. <laughs> uh, there, it was a kind of expressed frustration. Imagine somebody who's trying to perfect it and keep it within a certain time. And then I offer an idea and he's like, no, that doesn't align with what I want people to experience or what I want people to walk away with or how I want people to feel. So in the end, he really found his own way of making mm -hmm. the speech craft be what he wanted it to be because he really maintained his um, voice through everything and stayed as true to that as he could. Right. Ray, I don't think I have 20 minutes worth of something to talk about. I could surprise myself, but I, I certainly don't have. That was episode six of the District 7 podcast, where we talked to Jeff and Elizabeth Spitzer. This podcast is produced by Podmasters. Is a Toastmasters club dedicated to turning Toastmasters into podcasters. They meet twice a month on the first and third Sundays of each month. Join us if you would like to do a podcast. If you would like to try to learn how to do a podcast from the technical to the ideas to the producing. 
And also, this is part one of two of this interview. Watch for the second interview to come shortly.